up to this point, we've talked about the pigeonhole principle, and we are able to guarantee that at, there's some bin that has at least two objects. Now, if I have many objects, it may be the case that there's actually some bin that has more objects than just two. So there's actually a generalization of the pigeonhole principle that we can actually easily prove using the same techniques we did for the original pigeonhole principle. So this is one generalization of that. So let's, let's state it and we're going to prove it. Then we'll see an example. So I'm going to refer to this as the generalized pigeonhole principle. So I'm going to let n be a positive integer, just to make this a little easier to play around with. So this is the set of all integers, but I'm adding the plus just to say, hey, look, it's all the positive integers. So it's sort of one and above. So suppose n objects, suppose n objects are put into, into M bins. And I must stress that, that it's the case that M is uh, uh, when M, sorry, N is strictly bigger than M, then, then at least one bin contains at least the floor of n minus 1 over m. This is stripping away the fractional part. So for example, if I have a number like 2.5, the floor of 2.5 is 2. You just strip off the fractional part. You just keep the integer part. So that's what this, this, this symbol here, it's the floor function, or floor, is at least this. And in particular, this is actually, I should mention that this is actually equivalent to me writing this. What we call the ceiling, ceiling of n over m. So the ceiling is where you always round up the fractional part to the next integer. So for example, if I have 2.5, the ceiling of 2.5 is 3. Likewise, the ceiling of 2.9 is 3, and the ceiling of 2.001 is also 3. But 2, the ceiling of 2 is 2. Is at least the ceiling of n over m objects. Now, I'm not going to prove this equivalency here, but uh, this is true because these are both positive integers. Now, let's prove this. And you're going to find that this proof is really, really cute. It's honestly a much easier proof than taking and picking up its functional counterpart. We talked actually, when we talked about the pigeonhole principle, we talked also about how it connects to functions. Now, the proof there requires you to phrase out and formalize a lot about functions. Here, when we just think about objects and bins, it's actually rather nice. And the argument is quite similar. So. We're going to assume otherwise, for the sake of a contradiction. Well, let's think about that. What does it mean for this statement to not be true? Well, it means that there's going to be no bin that has this property, right? But that, what does that mean? That means that every bin has, at most, that many objects minus one. Right? <laughs> so, thus, similar to the way we also argued this for the pigeonhole principle originally, we had one, we had at most one per bin. Now we're going to have at most this minus one per bin. That's the total number of objects is at most, well, we're going to have one, we're, for each bin, you're going to have n minus 1 over m with the floor, like this. 
Remember, it's just one less, right? Because if you did, then they would satisfy this condition, right? But this is less than or equal to m times whatever this would be without rounding it down, right? This either has to be the same as that or it's bigger, right? But let's see, m times this over m, m divided by m, you just cancel those out, you end up with n minus 1. But this is strictly less than n, right? That means that the number of objects isn't actually equal to the number of objects. In fact, it's less than that. So the bin actually contains less objects than there actually are objects. There just isn't enough room. So, which is a contradiction. Piece of cake, right? So there's a little bit more setup in there that I sort of omitted just because you've seen the original proof. But the main argument is sitting right in front of you. So hopefully that is clear. So I'm going to do another, I'm going to do an example where we apply the generalized pigeonhole principle. But the big thing I really want you to point, just to see it in the back of your mind, is that this, when you rewrite this, this actually looks like something. It looks like the average, right? That's going to come up when we start talking about the averaging principle. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Just like take that idea, just put it behind your ear, and we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> so, so let's consider the next this example. So we're going to do a very simple application of the generalized pigeonhole principle, because this is very often how you might use it, at least on quick offhand. So given a group of 85 people, Do at least four have, have the same first letter for their family name? So you'd agree with me that at least if we're speaking in writing English, uh, the first letter of a name would be an English alphabet letter, right? It'll be one of the 26 letters. So if I give you any one of these people, when I look at their family name or last name, uh, it will have a first letter. And it must be one of the 26 letters in the English alphabet. So. Well, let's, uh, let's do what the same thing we did with the pigeonhole principle. We identify the objects and the bins. And because of the way this here, it's very natural. So here's the objects. So what are the objects? So the people, each with a family name. And we have the bins. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. So now all you have to do is you associate each family name with its its first letter, right? So now let's use the generalized pigeonhole principle. Let's apply, so with applying, that's just a remark, applying the generalized pigeonhole principle. The floor of 85 minus 1 over 26 plus 1. Now this right here is 84 over 26. Now if you take that and you try to play around with this, well, that's already going to be bigger than 3 times 26, but it's not bigger than 4 times 26. So you're going to end up with this being 3 plus 1, which is equal to 4.
So there's going to be four objects are in some bin. But what does that mean? That means that there is going to be, for my group of 85 people, each one with their own family name, there's going to be at least four of these people that are going to share the same first letter for their family name. So the answer is yes.